Okay, so you got a transfer to do 12 spans out of a 4 kV station. It's protected by a 1965 GE oil circuit breaker. It's four hard drawn copper at 4 kV, spaced one foot apart. But that's okay because all your men are in a category two shirt. They're going to be fine, right? Mm -hmm. I transferred that pole in 1970. And our total preparation was standing at the foot of the pole looking up there. And my foreman, Jerry Bailey, said, don't screw up. That was our preparation. Obviously, I didn't screw up, and I'm still here. We have a, we have a problem. <clears throat> we have a problem in the industry. That 4 kV out of the station on that oil circuit breaker is going to develop about a pound and a half of TNT in explosive force. And I'm not talking about tequila and tacos. <clears throat> it's going to be bad. It's going to be about 20,000 degrees, maybe more. And, it's, and it's, if it's spaced one foot apart and you're climbing on the pole and transferring in gloves, it's going to be a serious issue. But the problem is that a lot of our industry hasn't really figured out what to do about that yet. That's one of the reasons why we picked that topic for this forum today. We've had a number of articles that have been published uh, in IP and with a lot of SMEs, subject matter experts, that are dealing with the issues about arc slash protection in our industry. But the problem is that when you're doing it inside of a, uh, when you're doing it inside of a book or a magazine that only comes out periodically, you really don't have much of an exchange of ideas that you can ask questions about. Well, we put it in this format. Now, this allows us to be able to do that and clear the air. I've got a couple of things that I want to accomplish today as we work toward this. And here's what our I, and, and the reason why I'm writing this stuff down, everybody will tell you, I can usually talk for several hours on a safety issue and I don't have to shut up once. <clears throat> but this is one of those things I don't want to screw up. I don't want to miss anything. Here's what we want to, uh, we want to accomplish. We want, uh, we want everybody to leave here today knowing what your responsibility is to protect your people, your crew, and art, from art slash injuries or incidents. We want you to know what options are available. We want you to know what the rules say that you need to do, and we want you to know what resources are available to you uh, in the field. And that's the reason why we have this panel of, of uh, subject matter experts that are available. Uh, the one guy I don't know yet is Hector Silva. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Hector. And I'm going to give them all an opportunity in a minute to introduce themselves. Along with their, you know, I tell you what, in this room today, we probably have some of the key people who have been in the development of the art flash protection that we use in this industry. A lot of the research and testing that have been done in order to provide that protection has been done by uh, the, the people who are providing both the materials and the art uh, protective wear that, that we use or that we have available to us. But there's a few things that I want you to understand. And the, th this is important for you to understand in order that we can have a dialogue that makes sense to you. Here's the first thing you need to understand. And don't, don't jump up and scream at me and, because there's an exception coming behind each one of these things that I'm going to say. For instance, I'm going to say OSHA regulations are law. Consensus standards are not. Now, right away, a lot of people are going, but, 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 wait. Well, that's true. There's a but wait here. And that's how OSHA deals with consensus standards. Consensus standards, and if you go to the, uh, uh, to the appendix at the end of 269, 1910, everybody knows what I'm talking about, 1910, 269. If you go to the consensus standards back there, it says right on there that compliance with the consensus standards, not necessarily compliance with OSHA. But if you read interpretations from OSHA, or even worse, if you read citations from OSHA, who have cited contractors that have had incidents, they will say very clearly, they will either use the language from the consensus standard or they will say the consensus standard under the general duty clause is evidence that a hazard exists and that remediation is available. So just because a consensus standard is not law, you cannot just ignore it and say that it doesn't affect me because it does. Now that's, that, that can be, a, that, that's a good thing. We, because consensus standards can guide us. So <clears throat> OSHA says, and the entirety of OSHA right now about arcware protection is what? Anybody can quote it to me? I mean, it's really, really, really long and detailed. What does it say? Don't wear clothes that will 
Make it worse. That's it. In other words, they actually had people in our industry who said, well, okay, if everybody just went with no shirts, you got nothing to worry about, right? So all you'd have to wear is rubber gloves and no shirt. Yeah, 40 pounds ago, I probably would have tried that. Okay. <clears throat> now, here's the, uh, here's the next part. OSHA, in the treatment of hazards in the workplace, has a one, two, three criteria, right? What's the first thing that you do for hazards? Engineer them out, right? What's the next thing you try? Procedure them out. And then if you can't engineer them out, procedure them out, <clears throat> then what do you PPE. What is ARC protective wear? PPE. It's not the first thing you do. And in fact, what you will find out if you get into the study of your arc hazards in your workplace, you're going to find out that it's probably a combination of all of those things that are going to make your arc protection program work. Here's the next part. <clears throat> the C2 standard, ANSI C2, the National Electrical Safety Code, which provides the majority of the driving standards for our industry, still allows you to use non-arc rated clothing in a layered system, which is generally accepted to be cotton. Okay? ANSI, I mean, NFPA 70E does not allow you to do that. But does NFPA 70E relate to our industry? No. No, but if you remember in an article that I wrote to this, illustrate the absurdities of how we're handling this about two years ago, <laughs> some of you might remember that. It had a picture of a guy in a four calorie, uh, in a uh, Category 4 suit in a hood, and he was trying to put line hose on a, on a single-phase line. <laughs> yeah, I got in a lot of trouble for that one. Uh, <clears throat> that was to illustrate the absurdity of trying that, trying to use 70E as a standard for our system. The very first paragraph, or actually it's the second paragraph of 70E, says doesn't apply to utility industry. Calculations don't, but there is some very good information in the appendices about how you can layer clothing and how layer clothing can help and work and work together as a system of protection. Essentially, NFPA 70E is an electrical safety standard for indoor electricians, and the part on arcware is a very small part of that. Now, the very next thing that's going to happen to us as an industry is the long-awaited final rule of subpart B. How many of you think it's actually going to happen in May? Put your hands down because it ain't. If you go to the OMB's website where they list all of the final rules that they are reviewing before they can be, before they can be published, you won't see subpart V on it, which means they were a couple of months away. And I found out from Hugh Hoagland a little while ago, and you probably also, I think Brian, have some information on that. We're probably looking at, what, September? So we're still looking, but we do know pretty much what that standard says what, or what the new language. Now, for those of you who have not read it, shame on you. Everybody should have read it. I've read it a dozen times. It's great reading. <clears throat> it's very familiar because word by word, it's almost the exact same thing as the preamble to 1910 269. However, there is some expanded language because of some things that they left out, and some of that expanded language is in the arc protective wear or protecting employees from arc flash. One of the, the very, here's the most important thing that you've got to know. As an employer, an employer must evaluate the workplace for arc threat or arc hazard injuries. And you must have a plan and a program and you must train your people into arc hazard in their workplace and what your remediation practices are. And again, they don't have to be closed, but procedures, engineering, all those things combined together. So <clears throat> with that, that is the basis for you. Uh, hopefully that's the basis for your understanding. As you ask questions today, you've already got questions. Think about them. Feel free. We're going to try to answer that quickly and move along so we can get to everybody's questions. But now what I want to do is turn over for a few minutes to uh, Hugh and to Will and to Hector. Uh, if you will tell us about your background for those who don't know you and what your contribution to the industry is. I'm Hugh Hoagland. Uh, I do most of the arc testing in the world. I did uh, 70 fabrics last week, and uh, we test uh, arcware.com. We tested Connectrix Lab in Toronto, and we've also tested the lab in Switzerland. We've tested the Kima Lab, and we've tested a lab in Russia. And uh, we, we mostly test uh, fabrics and uh, fabric systems, fall protection devices, uh, gloves. We test uh, 
uh, garments. Uh, right now, uh, my biggest customer is Brazil. Uh, we did 100 garments for Brazil for every single month for the last three months, and this last month we only did 60. So the Brazilian garment uh, industry for Arc Flash is growing quite substantially, and it's utilities and non-utilities. And uh, their original arc test was quite interesting. They took a 13 kV line and put three electrodes and shot it straight at the shirt, and everything failed. And they came and asked me, how in the world could that be? And I said, well, you're right. Everything will fail if you put a 13 kV line, butt at electrodes, and shoot it straight at something. Everything will fail. But um, I do primarily arc testing and uh, electrical safety training for non-utilities mainly. Uh, we mo fo focus mostly on industrial companies. Um, my name is Will Vereen. Um, I've been in apparel for about 20 years. Um, I've been in charge of uh, the technical design uh, for FR Clothing for Riverside, the company I worked for, for 10 years. Um, and I've known Hugh pretty much the whole time since then. Um, so I'm involved with ASTM F F F18, F23. Um, I'm active on the committees that write F1506 and uh, the care and use standards for either industrial laundry or home laundry, uh, and, and had a, a pretty good role in those. Um, we, uh, the company I work for is called Riverside Manufacturing. We're over 100 years old. It's a, a woman-owned company uh, based out of Georgia, um, and we've been making protective apparel since 1994. Um, and um, just... Uh, my expertise really is in design. I have three patents for FR clothing design, and um, we're, I'm very involved with testing and standards. Thank you, Will. Hector. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Hector Silva. I've been in the uh, electric utility business uh, 37 years, and I'm the recipient of uh, what FR does, uh, spending a week in the burn units, uh, suffering second and third degree burns when I worked in the tools at El Paso Electric Company. So uh, that's my expertise, uh, and my first expertise on FR. So, uh, but uh, I work for ESEI as a safety consultant and manager and uh, work with several companies in the Northwest, uh, Southwest, and uh, actually throughout the United States, and uh, Brian's my boss. 